just very briefly review this whole nematode thing and get off our chest here. <coughs> Remember that we have a, a, a quite a, a range of nematodes, whereas with phylloxera we only have one single pest to worry about and attacking only grapes. With nematodes we have uh, a great number of different species and types and types of injury and migratory and uh, endo and ectoparasitic and so on. So it's a, uh, a big problem to try to completely control these. It's also a problem even to uh, uh, get a good rootstock for them because uh, in a given field, you may have one composition or mixture of percentages of these different nematodes and one rootstock might be fairly resistant to one species but not to the other. So it's a, it's a difficult problem really to get a good rootstock to uh, take care of a general all-purpose rootstock for nematode resistance. But we do have those that I told you about, and they are, fair, they are fairly resistant to one or the other root knot. It's our most common problem, and Dog Ridge and Salt Creek do fairly well against those. But then we have the problem of um, dagger nematodes, and uh, some of you asked a question last time if you can get a uh, a rootstock resistant to dagger nematodes, why do you need then to fumigate to prevent the transmission of family? And the reason I'm sort of late here and unorganized is I made the mistake of calling Dr. Rasky up to ask him a couple of quick, simple questions and got a 30-minute lecture. So uh, that sort of fouled me up a little bit. <laughs> um, he can never give you quite a simple answer he wants to give the course. But uh, uh, he pointed out, of course, that he agreed that with uh, Salt Creek and Dog Ridge, with the resistance they have to dagger nematode, that you would probably not get much chance of transmission of virus. I told him what you and I were discussing, but he, he didn't quite agree with that. He thought that the chances of transmission with those resistant rootstocks would be quite low. And they both have moderate resistance to phylloxera. So your question is, well, why not use them? Well, the pr problem is that uh, most of our coastal county soils are too rich and too fertile to use those stocks. The vigor just run away with them. So uh, there's been a little bit of, of questioning and, and possibilities of this answer in the coastal counties, but the farm advisors have been trying to discourage it because of this excessive vigor problem you get into with those two stocks. Now, one of the research projects that Dr. Leiter's been working on, and he had a grad student working on it for several years, is to try to breed uh, rootstocks resistant to dagger nematode, but of moderate vigor. And if we get those, then perhaps this problem can be taken care of. Anyway, we have these problems then of uh, root knot nematode being the most common in, the, in our California soils, especially in the main valley. There are some areas in which we have dagger nematode, high enough aside from its possibility of having fan leaf to do some uh, damage to the vines. And it's in these places where you have the so-called ectoparasitic nematodes that you can use nemagon or this DBCP. Now I want to review very quickly then these four chemicals. You have first DBCP, which is called nemagon by one company and fumazone by another. And this material is to be applied in the irrigation water and a flooding system in established vineyards. It is not a uh, systemic, it just kills the ectoparasitic nematodes that might be present. And if you have a fairly high pr proportion or percentage of ectoparasites, then this fumazone nemagon does a pretty darn good job of reducing them and uh, showing a, even a visible difference without even bothering about yield records in the appearance of the vines. But Dr. Eschie says that, of course, the main problem is uh, root knot nematode, which you know is endoparasitic. Remember, the female digs in and the tissue builds around her, and it's pretty hard to do much of a pro uh, good job with fumazone uh, on, or DBCP on endoparasitics such as lesion and root knot. So you get variable results. Some places they get very striking results, especially some in, for example, in the Livermore area in the Wente Vineyard trials. 
where the main nematode is, dagger nematode, uh, Dr. Rassi has gotten some quite striking results. But generally speaking, it's sort of a hit or miss deal whether or not you get a response to that. How bad is the Like a yeah. Well, that was a question I asked him, and he said that um, that that was a, that we don't have a lot of fan leaf down in the San Joaquin Valley, and that's where he's gotten a nice response occasionally to this material. So he says that uh, dagger nematode can build up enough; he can kill vines in the greenhouse with it. So I mean, with the infection of dagger nematode. So just as bad, just as bad. I would say perhaps if we want to rationalize a little bit that it might be as bad as phylloxera because it's similar in its injury to phylloxera. So I guess a real high concentration of dagger nematode would be probably worse than root knot. Okay, I wanted to quickly review these four chemicals. And then we have uh, two here, which is this DD that we talked about, which is uh, our 1,3-D or telone, which is a trade name. So forth for this long compound, which is, I tell you before, is one is dichloropropene and dichloropropane, a mixture of 50-50 of each. Basically, that's it. And then this is the material then is used in the, in the uh, coastal counties at very high rates. It's the one I said that you put 200 gallons at uh, 30 inches deep and then cross that with 50 gallons at uh, 12 inches deep. And to put this on, Remember, the soil has to, should be about uh, two-thirds normal field capacity and uh, uh, fairly warm temperature, 60 to 80 degrees. But this is an expensive application, 250 gallons per acre plus the equipment and so forth to put it on. Today is going to run you about $500 an acre. But that will kill the dagger nematode that knock them down and will also wipe out the oak root fungus, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So uh, it's something at 250 gallons per acre at those two rates. It, remember, we'll get one thing clear, that even this high rate will not completely eliminate dagger nematode, even though it's ectoparasitic. It's almost impossible to completely erase every bit of it. But with this type of application, you can knock them down to, uh, to a point where it's hard to find any for the next three or four years in sampling. And so maybe in 10 years, they come back. And in this 30-minute lecture I got this morning, Dr. Raskin says that one fortunate thing about it is that every time the dagger nematode molts or goes from one generation to the next, each generation has to feed on a root that has fan leaf if it's going to contain it or continue it. In other words, it's a little bit like seed, uh, the fact that most viruses don't transmit through seeds. So I, point, I, I gave him that example back. He said that's a good example. So each generation... Each living generation has to feed on a root that has fan leaf if it's going to continue the tradition, <laughs> okay, continue the infection. So with that, you can knock it down pretty well, but the point I want to get across is that this does not eradicate uh, dagger nematode or in none of the fumigates eradicate any of these soil pests. And then we go to methyl bromide. I was going to make this a five-minute review. It looks like we're going to get the lecture over. Uh, we got methyl bromide then. And methyl bromide is the one, remember, that they put on the tarp. And some of the older recommendations indicate you only had to put this down a short distance, but it's the standard rate now is 400 pounds at 24 inches. 400 pounds at 24 inches. And of course, as you know, it is covered with a tarp. And uh, some question brought up in some personal discussions with some of you that uh, whether or not you needed the tarp. Uh, the, the methyl bromide will go through that polyethylene, but it goes through, it, at least you slow it down a little while before it leaks through. And in that slowing it down, you sort of concentrate in those top few inches where you need to get the most effect. So that. Uh, the fact that it does uh, move out of the soil slowly uh, has brought up the question, and they've got trials underway now, whether or not they can put it in at 24 inch or 30 inch depth and leave the tarp off. And the argument is whether or not leaving the, with the tarp on, they 
are sure that pretty sure they can get oak root fungus kill, but there's some question whether they're leaving the tarp off may cut down on the kill of oak root fungus. So these are experiments that are underway. And it's quite important because of this disposal problem of that polyethylene and the fact that it means 100 or $150 an acre saving in cost. So uh, maybe by next year we'll have some dope on that. Remember that methyl bromide then, and also carbon bisulfide then, which is the fourth one here, <coughs> both have similarities in the fact that they both will kill the dagger nematode, they both will take care of oak root fungus, and they both will do a pretty good job of killing seeds of weeds and grasses and what have you. And a further common characteristic among these two is that both of them have to be applied when the soil is as dry as possible. So that means late fall, and remember my comment about if necessary, plant some cover crops or something to dry the soil out. Okay, maybe that little bit of review helps a little bit. Four materials in, one, two, three, four materials. But this one, of course, is used on established vineyards. This is used in the, in, where you do not have oak root fungus, in the San Joaquin Valley mainly, and in the coastal counties, these two. And they're all expensive. This one is not expensive. It's only applied at something like, oddly enough, about two gallons per acre and dissolved in the irrigation water. I think this stuff is still relatively expensive per gallon. Okay, uh, after the last lecture, I realized that after giving this course as often as I have, that what I should have done was to uh, discuss phylloxera and then oak root fungus and then come back to nematodes because nematodes so tied in with the oak root fungus. But uh, you live and learn, I guess. Okay, so we want to talk about this, this uh, problem fungus of the coastal counties is oak root fungus is really a misnomer. Because this fungus, our malaria, a malaria, is the uh, scientific name of this fungus, and it attacks a great number of plants in the world. Uh, mostly it's, it's restricted to, well, it seems to be attack woody plants more than the annual herbaceous types, but even some of those can be attacked. And uh, this, material, this uh, fungus is a widespread fungus over the world, and especially, it's, uh, especially in Chures here on our west coast. I said it attacks a lot of native plants and many, many of our cultivated plants in yards. And going many times when you see trees and plants dying in a yard, it's probably because of oak root fungus. Uh, somebody asked once why it was called oak root fungus. And in doing some reading or something, it turns out that the first research work that was done on this disease in California was done actually out of the Riverside Station. But uh, one of their favorite host plants that they worked with was the native oak tree and therefore they hung the name oak root fungus on it which is sort of a dirty deal to the oak tree but uh, as I say it's widespread and uh, it, I'll show you some slides in a moment it sort of does a, a general weakening and yellowing of the foliage often it's in spotty areas often where an oak tree has been pulled out that had it had the infection and uh, sometimes these plants will drift on for a few years, off and on, sort of downhill. Sometimes they wilt and die rather suddenly. And I'll show you why in a few moments. Uh, because it affects, it grows between the bark and the xylem, right in the phloem and cambium area. And if it spreads around the trunk rather rapidly, it just does a fine job of girdling the plant. And out it goes. And sometimes it, uh, the conditions are not good for its growth, and it will continue then to grow on for quite a while. Um, I don't know what we might be better to look at the slides first and then talk about some of the controls and so forth. So let's look at the slides so you know what we're talking about. Can we catch that? One of you, catch that, would you please? Oops.
Or this is a shot from up in the upper part of uh, Sonoma Valley. And you see it just looked like sort of an unhappy grapevine. And uh, that's, I got this slide from Ryder a few minutes ago. I hadn't seen it myself. But you just see the sort of a general uh, drying back. And so what is happening is a part of the, as I say, the uh, cambium uh, phloem area is being girdled by this fungus. So it's gradually weakening the vine. Next slide. And here is a shot from the top of the truck showing what, we, what is most typical of the spots in this Napa and Coast County areas where a say oak root fungus may just occur in a circle like this. And this is what I was talking about in last lecture when I said I would just go ahead and plant, unless you have a, you're buying an old vineyard that has a lot of spots like this, then you might, it might pay to go ahead and spend the 400 per acre and do a good job on it. But in a spot as small as this, you could pull out all these vines and hire somebody to come in and treat by hand. But one of the, one of the problems of treating these spots like this and often leads to failure is that a, you're too, too tempted just to pull out these weak vines and fumigate right in here. If you do this type of thing, you've got to grit your teeth and pull out one complete circle of healthy vines all around it in order to block it off completely. Otherwise, you've just taken out the core and left yourself a nice perimeter of infection material. The next slide. Now, here's what the stuff looked like on the roots. These are little roots about uh, finger size or so on. And you get this white mycelium that grows right under the bark. And uh, it's sort of, they say it's fan-shaped, but I've never seen it quite fan-shaped. But it's, it's a nice, pretty white uh, uh, material right under the bark as you pull it off. And it sort of has a pleasant smell. It sort of smells like, it doesn't have the sour smell to it that you usually get with rotting material. It actually smells sort of like mushrooms. So frequently you pick it up, and as soon as you pull that bark back and smell it, and it sort of makes you think of mushrooms, or you're on, you've got one clue to it. Now, I guess I got this slide a little bit out of order because we want to talk on, about how it spreads from one vine to the next. And it spreads by a sort of a root-like project called a rhizomorph. We'll see it in a couple of the other pictures, I think. And, and these rhizomorphs are root-like extensions that, that grow. This is formed here, of course, here's the mycelium itself. But then it forms these little root-like things which grow through the soil and uh, contact another root. And this way, the, it is spread from one vine to the next in those spots that you were looking at. OK, next slide. And here's just a close-up showing you how, how pretty that Surely is, but see when it goes all around most of the roots, eventually around the roots, or especially if its first big infection is around the main base of the trunk. See, if you get a little bit of this on the roots, you've got lots of roots spread out there three feet away, so it takes a while to kill it off. But if you get the first real buildup of it right around the base of the plant, then it doesn't take long to girdle it, and you can get a rather sudden killing of the plant. You see them rise them off over here and some here. Okay, next slide. And that's the one where I really wanted to show you the rhizomorphs. And you can see here how they grow and twist around the root. And uh, you can see them coming out of here, too. And here's, this is bark of the vine. But here's the most classical, typical way the rhizomorph grows. See, it looks like a little root. But uh, that's the way that it spreads. Is that next slide? I think that's the last of that. Yeah, that's the last of that. OK, that's what it looks like. And uh, I say that's how it's normally spread. Uh, I said that the, the fungus itself is rather widespread. And it is. And um, I think in a very rough generalization, it's sort of like mushrooms. You know, mushroom fungus spores are present nearly everywhere. But the mushrooms don't grow just everywhere. They just grow when the conditions are just right. And one of the conditions, of course, for our malaria is to uh, have wet conditions, so I'll, so I'll be wet. So if you really over-irrigate, especially this is why it's so common around people's yards and where you have oak trees and lawns and so forth, you get a, the uh, ideal conditions for the oak root fungus to take off. And of course, the, under 
yard conditions, otherwise you can frequently take care of this by just digging out a, a basin around the trunk of the tree and letting it dry out, and maybe even painting the base of the tree where these uh, areas, infected areas are with a Bordeaux mixture. That's a that copper lime mixture to take care of it. And uh, basically that's why our trees that you see around the campus here have those basins around them filled with rocks and so forth, is to try to keep it dry enough to keep oak root fungus from getting started. If you get oak root fungus started, there's nothing, no way to, uh, uh, in the vineyard or in these situations, you can hardly uh, dry out a vineyard without having crop loss. The best thing to do, as I say, is to treat those small areas and if necessary, treat them by hand. And uh, we've already gone through all the treatments, the carbon bisulfide and the methyl bromide and talking about the nematodes, so you should have those treatments well in mind. Now, that's rather once over lightly on that. Is there any questions? No, no, DD will not. See, that's why I said in this, uh, in my one, two, three, well, I erased them, didn't uh, When I gave you the one, three D here, I said that this could be used in the coastal county, I mean, in the San Joaquin Valley, where you don't have much problems with oak root fungus. But if you're going to go to taking care of nematodes over in the coastal counties, where you also have the possibility of oak root fungus, then you better use one of those two. Now, again, this morning, Dr. Ash said they were doing some experiments with very heavy doses of DD, and it had some success down in the Lodi area uh, with possible control oak root fungus, but he was not about ready to say that DD would control it. Okay, your question. Well, actually, uh, I guess in terms of life of a vineyard, it doesn't spread too rapidly and the situations I've seen, I've seen old vineyards where the spots weren't more than, well that was a fairly old vineyard there that you saw and you saw it was about six vines across or something like this so um, I guess if you didn't over irrigate and had a, and you wouldn't be over irrigating in the coastal area anyway that uh, you could probably live with it but if you have a, a, an area the size of this room and uh, it's practically no fruit on it, that's fairly, that's a drain on your on your income. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you see, we are talking about the spread from one point here, and how fast it was spread out. But now, if you pull out and leave a perimeter like that, then you've got a whole bunch of new points for it to spread from. So in this direction, then, uh, it wouldn't be the same as the original spread from the center point because now you've got a lot of center points. Well, I went over that. I told you it depends on uh, whether it's on the small roots or whether it hits the main trunk and so on. Depend on where, what percentage of the roots get hit and what roots get hit first. But uh, typically, and some of these that go out rather quickly, you can dig down uh, six inches below the surface of the soil, down where the soil is a little bit moist, and you can pick it up on the trunk itself. And those vines go down pretty fast. Right. This is one of the other main sources because uh, the armillaria will live even on dead wood if it's kept moist. It'll, the fungus, will, uh, those rhizomorphs and the fungus spread will even on dead roots. And this is a big point to bring out. So that he, uh, one of the uh, papers I was reading here, something I guess right here, said that uh, armillaria root rot is spread by infected wood carried by man or by floodwaters or it can be spread by tra the uh, transmission or transplanting of infected plants. And uh, it can occasionally be found in woody material such as leaf mold that you go to the mountains and get to bring home and plant your azaleas and camellias in. So when they said that if you use that, if you're going to use leaf mold from, the oak, from oak trees and so forth, that it should be absolutely and thoroughly sun-dried for several months before you use it because if there's any moisture there at all, it can continue to live. Remember, it can live on dead wood, but it can't live on completely dry wood. Hmm? Well, of course, that'd be the way to do it. Steam it through the yeah, autoclave. Yeah. Any other? Okay, I said that uh, this series that we're going to follow is going to cover fungus problems for a moment, and we've covered oak root fungus, 
got that out of the way. Now let's go to the surface, to the top part of the plant and hit another one, which is uh, referred to as dead arm. And this is a, we're going to cover the straight fungus problems first and then some that are sort of questionable. So our next one is uh, dead arm. And this is a uh, scientific name, which I guess you all remember, Fomopsis. If I can spell it myself. Viticola. Fomopsis viticola. And I think you have to know that name because this is a pretty important uh, fungus problem we have in California. Uh, its main area of trouble, well, let, let's say it this way, that uh, it's a springtime, high relative humidity, cool weather fungus. Springtime, which here, which, of course, implies uh, cool weather and relatively high humidity. And it kills and affects the basal shoots of the plants. And actually, since it attacks them only while they're young, or under our conditions here, you only have cool weather and high humidity while the shoots are small. So that's when it's very active, and it, and it attacks the base of those shoots and almost girdles those. And that's why it's called dead arm. It ought to be called dead spur or dead shoot, but it's called dead arm for some reason. And it'll attack all green parts of the plant under these conditions, these springtime conditions. It's native to the eastern U.S., and I don't know why it doesn't do more damage. Well, it does do a lot of damage back there. I think that's why... It's one of the big problems of growing Concord up in New York State, and that's why they often bring up two or three shoots, two or three canes from the trunk, I mean, from the very ground. And they bring up a couple of trunks so that when one of them gets dead arm, severely dead arm, they'll cut it off and then go on to the next and bring up another sucker. So when the damage gets too great, they can cut them off and start over again. Uh, in California, its most serious area has been as you might expect, uh, from here from Davis down to perhaps Modesto, with Lodi being the real center of it, because there's where you get the cool weather and the, and the relative high humidity later on into the spring. Now, uh, let's, let's get this in your notes, and then, uh, then we'll show the slides. Now, the, uh, this is a, they say it's a fungus, and the, and the spores develop in this uh, wood as summer goes on. And then they'll overwinter in those prunings that they're left on the ground and on the leaves. And then when you get uh, light rains and so on in the spring, uh, those raindrops hit those dead spore areas and disperse them into the air where they fall on your young succulent growth. So that the thing to do, of course, is if you really have a bad situation, is to, in this situation, there'll be one, one real reason why you should burn the prunings. You might haul the prunings out and burn them to try to get rid of as much of it as possible. But then on the plant itself, we have two controls that you can use. And one of them is sodium arsenite. Uh, it's the old one. Uh, <coughs> and this sodium arsenite is pretty dangerous material. You have to wear protective equipment and and uh, I don't know if you have to get permit to use it or not, but I would assume you have to. But uh, a sodium arsenite uh, at about um, four, four pounds or three quarts, three quarts of sodium arsenite per 100 gallons sprayed on during the dormant season will, will do a fairly good job of knocking it down. I'll tell you why we use it instead of the other material that can be used is cap tan. And captan is a fairly uh, relatively uh, harmless material that can be used. Uh, captan at a, uh, applied at about a, a pound and a half, you don't need to remember these figures, but a pound and a half of 50% uh, captan uh, per 100 gallons applied during the er very early growth stage. That is when the buds are just swelling with one application and then another application when they're just an inch or two long. will do a pretty good job of eliminating it from your vineyard. And uh, you, you say if captan is so nice and you, you, you can use two sprays of a relatively harmless material and wipe it out, then why use the sodium arsenide? Well, the next 
fungus we're going to talk about is measles. And measles will not be wiped out with, with uh, captan. So if you, have, if you have a possibility of having both of them present, then you're better off to spray with sodium arsenide. But measles is not, are not fortunately not so widespread in, these, in this low dye area and so on as, as is uh, dead arm. So my feeling is to spray with the captan and, and forget the sodium arsenide. Now remember I tell you it affects all green portions of wood and so on and we'll kill these and girdle them. And let's take a, a look at what and pull this Okay, let's see what this looks like. Now, here's some uh, sh uh, shoots taken right out there by the winter vine and that block of uh, uh, tokays. Tokay seems to be, I don't know what tokay is, much more susceptible than other varieties or just because the conditions are present in, in the uh, low dye area. But I have a feeling that tokay is one of the more susceptible varieties. And you can see on these shoots here, why it's called dead arm, if this girdling, where it affects these lower shoots here, and you get enough of this uh, parallel cracking, it, it tends to crack on the bark in, in long, parallel, open crack wounds like that when it becomes severe. And if you get enough of those around the base of it, then you can see that that would girdle the shoot early in the season enough so that it'd be very, very poorly matured if it, if, even, if it didn't kill it. So that next year it might not even push out. And that's why they call it dead arm, but as I say, that's why I would call it dead spur. But you can see it affects the young wood here. It affects the rachis, the stem of the cluster. You can see these spots on it here. It affects the petiole. See it on the petiole? And the petiole here. And then it, it actually goes out in here and, uh, and affects the berries a little bit. But at least it affects the, the base stem, the petioles, the framework of the cluster and the leaves, and, and uh, on these leaves we'll get progressively closer up here so we can show you the spots, the giveaway spots on the leaves. Let's see the next slide. Now, frequently it will affect, it, it starts out as a little, it looks like a fly speck on the leaf, and then the, the fly speck is, is surrounded then later on by this yellow tissue which finally becomes necrotic or dead, and if you get a real high infection, those areas coalesce or come together in such that they die out then, and then a little bit of wind action or brushing and those spots fall out. So you get a, a holy looking leaf from some of these uh, dead arm, real high dead arm infections. The next slide. We might be able to see some of this out in the vineyard uh, this afternoon or next week. See these holes that then have come into the leaves here where those first original spots start now with a little black spot in the middle and then spreading with the yellow spreading around till the tissue dies and then falls out. And you can get some pretty bad leaves. This sometimes resembles frost injury, and sometimes it looks a little bit like leafhopper injury. But if leafhopper injury, if you look at it with those specks that you get on leafhoppers, you don't have that little telltale pinpoint of brown, black, right in the middle. A little, just a fly speck of, of a little hard black dot in the middle that starts it out. And uh, with frost injury, this looks a lot like frost, I have to admit, but when you get frost injury, I used to have a real good slide to show frost injury, but uh, when you get frost injury that causes this sort of thing, you'll find that the frost, oddly enough, kills little particular islands. Just, it'll kill a complete little island, very uh, geometrically, or whatever the word is, but uh, it'll, t it'll take out little islands here so that when they're frosted and they're yellow and green, it sort of looks like a land uh, view from the air of a San Joaquin Valley field. Some of them yellow and some of them green, some of them so it's sort of a, a very nicely patterned area. Where this, as you see, it's just a mess of, of uh, spots that have no pattern to them at all. So you can tell the difference between frost injury, which approaches this stage, and uh, leafhopper injury, and dead arm pretty well by those spots. Okay, the next slide. Is that, is that the last one of that? Let's see the next one. Yeah. I think that's the last one. Let's see what. Yeah, that's the last of that one then. Okay, now, 
as I say, this is a, uh, a true fungus compared to some we're going to talk about later. And uh, is it, it, actually, the problem seems to have gotten worse in, in the past, in the years I've been here, at least because uh, 15 years ago, the only place where we had this dead arm problem was, say, around the Lodi area. But over the years, for some reason, it has spread even in the time I've been here down to, you can occasionally see it down in the Fresno area, but only rarely. And of course, you can see it here at Davis, and you don't really see much of it in the coastal area. Even though you have the high humidity and the cool weather, it doesn't seem to be uh, much of a problem over there. And uh, hopefully, it'll stay that way. So I don't know how it, uh, why it spreads and why it has not spread to the coastal counties, but it has spread southward into, toward Fresno area. And uh, other than those two controls I gave you, the fact that you can use the sodium arsenite uh, in the dormant season and the, uh, the captan in the early spring, that's about the only control, and burn the wood if you've got a real bad infection with the material. Okay, uh, yes? Right, it's first infections are in the leaf. That's where you usually see it, I should say. Uh, I don't know, it works down into the leaf from that. I guess it, attack, it attacks all green parts. But you see it in those little spots on the leaf really before you see those, cr those cracks on the... Uh... You the leaf the stock no, no, because it attacks anything that's green, like you say, in the clusters and everything. Do you get uh, bunch rot at the storage from it? No, not from, no, I don't think so, not from dead iron. Uh, you got a good question, but... Uh, I don't know, I said it's a cool weather, but I guess it's not a cold storage fungus, that's the answer. Because uh, otherwise it would, it would uh, uh, persist right into the fall and, and it would start out very early. Now I don't think that you could consider it a cold storage fungus at all. Another question? Okay, then the next one we want to talk about is one which is, I say I want to cover all the fungus problems first, but I want to say mildew, which is the next real fungus problem to the, ne to the next lecture and uh, take a, a fast look at what we call black measles. And uh, black measles has a lot of names. Uh, some of the foreign students may know as Spanish measles. Well, it's, it's called Spanish measles here, too. Spanish measles. Uh, or or, uh, or uh, black measles. Or uh, in Europe, it's called Esca disease, and sometimes it's called uh, black mildew, and I'll show you in a moment why it's called black mildew. And sometimes it's called apoplexy, which I don't like to use, but uh, that it has been called apoplexy, which means, implies a rather sudden death, and uh, sometimes it, you can get rather sudden dying of the parts of the plant, but you don't get a complete kill of the plant, or at least in any situation I've known, in a very short time. Now, the symptoms on, of this, uh, this is, well, let me start over and say that uh, before, we, I guess I'll, I'll do the best, the other way around first, show you the symptoms, and then we'll discuss what it's all about. So, once again, let's see what it looks like. Now here's why it's called black mildew. You see, uh, here's a, a cluster, a normal cluster, and here's one that's badly affected with uh, Spanish measles or black mildew. So next slide. And that one's upside down, but that's, hey. Now black measles are quite easy to see on uh, white varieties, it's the one you just saw. So, but uh, on black varieties, sometimes, thank you, that's a, it's a little harder to see. This is a uh, black variety in the coastal counties. And uh, here you can see where the black measles have, when it comes in, it, can, it tends to dry and shrivel up these clusters. And one of the things which I'll tell you in a moment, turn on the lights, or I guess you can see one up in here, is that black measles doesn't normally hit all of the vine at once. It may hit just one cane or one shoot, and it doesn't hit all, uh, it doesn't, hit uniformly over the clusters because you can have some rather normal looking clusters right next to clusters which, which are as badly shriveled as this. So one of the symptoms, one of the easy ways to diagnose it is the 
the variable nature over the plant, the fact that you can get uh, many normal clusters, a few that, uh, that are burnt, you can get many normal looking shoots, and then some that are really shriveled and burnt like this. Okay, next slide. And here's a, a picture of, more typical picture of black measles on Thompson seedless. You see, you get this type of burning of the leaves. And if you remember, you don't remember, but uh, when I talked about boron deficiency, I said that sometimes you can confuse boron deficiency with measles because some, to a certain degree, there's a little bit of similarity. But you see, you can get this type of burning on some parts of the shoot, and other parts of the shoot look perfectly all right. And on the other end, you'll have clusters like this with, with the measles. Okay, next slide. Now, it isn't really dark enough in here to see this, but uh, this is why they call it measles. This is a Thompson seedless berry, or a tokay, and you can see the uh, close-up here of the individual berry with the little measles spots on it, where, from which it gets its name. Sorry, it isn't dark enough to really see that, but uh, that's where it gets the name uh, measles. Okay. Now, here's a shot of Thompson seedless. Thompson seedless seems to be quite susceptible to measles. And you can see a rather normal looking cluster here. We're gonna to have to get another projector for next year. I found out when I was trying to operate the projector, it's not the projection, this is the projector. Uh, and we can't use a carousel on showing uh, slides because about a, a quarter of my slides are bound in glass. And if you ever get a carousel projector, it won't take glass bound slides. Well, if you put them in 40 trays, the, the trays that only hold 40 slides, they will. They will? Yeah. Okay. If they're yeah. Glass. Well, these, and we get a rather thick glass. Anyway, I've broken a lot of them and jammed up the projector, so we have to use this, but we'll get something done. But anyway, you can see normal clusters here, some lightly measled in here, one over here in the dark is pretty bad off, and yet a normal cluster up here. So it's, a not, it's an odd sort of thing. Now, I think that's the last slide of that. And I say it's an odd thing that way, and speaking of oddities, it's an odd thing in another way in that although in some ways it acts like a fungus, in other ways it doesn't. So it's, it's sort of a question mark as just exactly what it is. And it's been the subject of quite a bit of research work. Uh, some, some it will, it will I say it acts like a fungus, and yet normal fungicides like Captan there won't touch it. So that's the one then that we have to use sodium arsenide on. And sodium arsenide is, is pretty rough on a vine. The, uh, it's almost a case where the, the, uh, the cure is worse than the disease. So that uh, you have to be very careful, not only the man putting the material on, but you have to be very careful in uh, applying sodium arsenide. It's the same treatment that we talked about for uh, uh, dead arm, that is three pints of sodium arsenide per 100 gallons, but you have to, and the vines have to be thoroughly dormant, and the usual uh, recommendation is to prune the vines, and then wait two or three weeks before you spray. And that's very important, because you gotta let those pruning wounds plug up, sort of heal over, because you go in with sodium arsenide a week after you prune, and the uh, wounds will soak up enough of the sodium arsenide that the, the vines will be a whole lot worse off than they were with the measles. In fact, you might kill some of them. And then, still, and then you should spray, the, put the spray so much, so much as possible aimed at the older part of the wood for two reasons. First, of course, it's that young wood will absorb more and you're more likely to damage the buds. But the second point is that you, you rarely find uh, measles with vines that are younger than about eight years old. And that gave us one of the first clues as to what might be this, the source of it. And it seems to be associated with the rot in the old wood. You don't need to remember this, but uh, the grad student that did it found that it was associated, well, you should know they're associated with what is called white rot. And this is Foamy's Ignarius. But you don't need to know this. I'll just mark through it like that. But it's white rot of the old wood, which you must remember, seems to be the source. And what this, I was on this grad student's committee that worked on this, by Dr. Hewitt, and the best that he could come out with was that the white rot fungus in decaying the old wood released some sort of uh, byproduct which got into the sap stream, which was toxic to the plant. 
and it, that this, it, this was the end result then. See, it, so it is associated in a way with a fungus, with this white rock fungus on the old wood, but the direct damage seems to be some sort of toxic material that is given off by, in the, by the uh, growth of this white rock organism. So that you sell them and say get it in, in, in vines with old wood. The other thing that's odd about the thing is that it, it doesn't do you in this case any good to go in if you've got a vineyard where you have quite a bit of, of measles and it doesn't do any good to go and mark that vine this year and say that that one's got it and this one's got it and this one's got it and I'm just going to treat those vines because if you don't do a thing to it, next year those vines may not show a thing and the vine over here and one here and one here will show it. It's a crazy thing. So, and, for, and one final thing about this, about this uh, uh, sodium arsenide is that it is so dangerous and so uh, crippling to the vine that you only want to use it when you really begin to get a, uh, quite a noticeable amount of measles in the vineyard. And even then, you only want to put it on about every uh, third year or so, every second or third year. You, it's, the vines can't take it every year. So see, it's, a, it's a sort of a desperate cure measure that you have to live with. Okay, is there any other, any question on that? You got three things pretty fast this morning. What is the effect on wine quality measles? I don't know other than it would be just the normal effect of partly rotten berries. Yeah. Now, remember it usually, one thing I didn't mention, that it usually comes on more or less in midsummer. You see about the time those clusters are, well, you wouldn't see any up till now probably. So it's about the time those berries are nearly full size, about the time you begin to look for it. And it'll often hit just one shoot at a, and take one shoot at a time like this. Okay, one further point. Remember, those of you who want some sort of last-minute discussion, that Monday will be our last discussion period if you want to uh, plan for some, qu come in with some questions.